thank you very much. Uh, my name is Andrea Pusic. Uh, I'm allowed to tell you that I'm uh, vice president of uh, Pirate Party of Slovenia, and that's pretty much all about that. And uh, it's true, yes, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, democracy 2.0. Uh, or a way to hack into democracy. Um, it's a little bit uh, humbling experience for me to speak after Mr. Buzak. He is a very interesting and experienced uh, speaker. And uh, I am uh, particularly glad that uh, it turned out uh, to be a positive view on the uh, European Union because lately I am confronted with a lot of uh, uh, well-founded and not so well-founded uh, Euroscepticism, so uh, I am really glad that uh, we had such a positive and uh, optimistic view on European Union. Which doesn't mean that we don't have any problems. Obviously we do, uh, as you all know. Uh, we are all talking about crisis right now and uh, it is worth taking a little moment and thinking about all of this and how we can possibly make it better. Um, okay. Uh, maybe a couple of words about history, what is democracy and how it started, uh, just because uh, we are so uh, uh, keen about uh, changing it, improving it, so maybe it's a good idea to look at it a little bit closer. Um, what Greeks had 2,500 years ago or even more, uh, I'm calling democracy 0.1. It tells us something that it was not a really a full democracy. No? It had some very original ideas, but uh, we have to be aware that it was a very small community, that not everyone was involved. The slaves and women were left out. We must not forget that. There was no proper voting. What they did is they accepted idea by acclamation. That means who was who got the bigger applause won. Uh, so there was no clear mandate. If you won, you don't know what kind of power it gives to you. So it was or very very uh, fundamental, basic, and uh, not really a full blown. Uh, democracy as we like to see today. The first incarnation of uh, such democracy, I think, uh, we can see about 250 years ago, uh, arguably in the United States. Uh, they have uh, improved upon the idea on a couple of, uh, couple of points. Uh, there was no small community involved anymore. It was the whole country involved. They had a voting system. They had to have some kind of delegation, obviously. And these delegates had a clear mandate. So the rules were set up. And once you have a well-defined set of rules, uh, then you can, you can consider it 1.0. So, what were the main characteristics of this uh, democracy 1.0? Well, the idea of democracy is that everybody has a vote and these votes are equal. But obviously in a big country like United States, in the 18th century, you cannot gather these votes all together at the same time at the same point. So it's not practic practically viable. So you had to have some kind of practical solution. How to transcend space and time, how to do all these things together. And uh, you need some kind of compromise, uh, some kind of packaging. 
So you have to have representatives, delegates, so you can deal with the numbers, with the sheer number of water, waters. You have to have parties, because you have to communicate all this idea in a packaged form, so it can be practic practic practically useful. And you have to some term. When you are voted for, you get a mandate, and this mandate needs time for anything actually to be done. In those days, it was quite normal to have uh, four or five years to get uh, all your ideas, to put them, uh, put them uh, to work. And guess what? Uh, nothing changed. For the last 250 years, we have the same system. You have parties, delegates, four-year or five-year term. And it was all designed 250 years ago for the environment, that for the technology, uh, for the advancement of civilization that was back then. And obviously you have some problems, and we are prob experiencing this, this very problems we are experiencing right now. Uh, the biggest problem probably is the distance from the voter. Uh, they are not in contact. Uh, once the delegate or representative is elected, he is free to follow his own agenda for the whole term, for the four, four years, five years, and so on. He makes some promises, but after so long time, these promises can get into conflict with some other interests, and so on and so on, so the things change. And this contact has been lost, and it never happens, happens again. So the direct consequence of this loss of contact is uh, a phenomena of oligarchy. It is very well known and documented problem. I think all of you are aware of that, just by simple sayings that all power is corrupt. You know? It is connected with this idea, and we all know about that. We all have these feelings, feeling that politicians are not really working for our interest, that they are following their own interest. That problem is called oligarchy. Detachment from the ruling class from everybody else. <coughs> Sorry. But this is not the only problem that we have. Um, the political system where you have packaged ideas for a long time uh, divides people. The people like to take sides. So after some time, you have a huge fan of political option A and huge fans of political option B. And then generations passes, uh, things happen, and these affiliations get deeper and deeper. So the, 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 the people get very emotional, very ir irrational about these decisions. I'm going to vote for the party X for the rest of my life, no matter what. I like them. It is not rational decision anymore. And vice versa. Somebody else will, are going to vote for, for the other party because his parents did so, and he likes them without even thinking why. Uh, so once you have this uh, passion-based division in the society, then you have uh, a phenomena called partisanship. It is like two football clubs. No? It's not rational at all. They just meet on the street and they want to fight. So it, uh, it, it, it's, it is really can become some kind of ugly play, play, playground where uh, the, there is a very hot exchange without any rational substance. And if you look at the television and read the papers and things like that, you can find a lot of it today. All things which are happening right now in Slovenia are very much irrational. The real issues, like do we really need a bad bank or not, are pretty technical. 
but the people get to be very emotional about that without even understanding deeply what does it mean. Just because they are uh, fond of option A or option B. So this kind of system uh, is in a context, constant conflict. It is liking conflict. It feeds on conflict. So decisions are all painful. They are all compromised and they all take a very long time to reach. Okay, I think I have a more uh, pleasant slides ahead. And then the internet came. <laughs> now you can read a lot about people like me being very unrealistic and romantic. Yeah, we have some interesting sound. Uh, uh, being completely uh, unrealistic because uh, we are expecting that uh, really internet is bringing some deep changes in the society. Uh, so they would say, oh, it's, it's not true. You know, the internet is just another technical phenomena. It will die, die out uh, like everything else. It's not so important, blah, 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 and so on. Uh, I'm not buying that at all. I'm even not going to argue against that. I think that common sense is telling us that the internet is the biggest thing we are experiencing in a long time. It brings a huge cultural change. Uh, it changes society very profoundly and uh, it's more than obvious. So does it affect uh, politics? Will it affect poli political system? Yes, and absolutely yes, in a very deep way. Why? Uh, we have seen that we have some problems with democracy and they are stemming mostly from the de detachment of the representative from the, from the voters. And Internet is eliminating these distances. Internet is eliminating physical distances. You don't have to travel to meet someone. There is no time problem. You can do it immediately now, real time. You can communicate with anyone you want. So three very important problems have been eliminated. And one problem which we even didn't know it existed before the internet, is the information access. We couldn't imagine that we can nowadays access so much information so fast. So accessing the information is not a problem anymore. Everybody can be informed as much as he wants. He, he just has to sit down and Google a little bit. So why not? Why wouldn't we, after so long time, use the opportunity and change the political system, improve it? Uh, what we are talking about, what kind of improvement we have in mind is uh, something that is a combination of so-called e-democracy and direct democracy. Uh, E-democracy is maybe a little bit, uh, uh, maybe a little bit uh, not so well-defined uh, term. I would say any kind of uh, uh, voting or uh, democratic activity which is done with the computer and internet doesn't matter. We can duplicate the current system using computers. So that would be e-democracy. Direct democracy is something that all these Greek guys did in uh, this uh, square in Athens. They all came there. They've been at the same place at the same time exchanging ideas. So if we combine these two things, we come to something that we call EDD. Electronic Direct Democracy. 
Now, there are some important ideas which are different, which are improvement over what we are seeing right now. So the one is called proxy democracy. We have to understand this to move forward, so uh, a little bit about that. Uh, proxy democracy means that you can delegate you wo your vote to somebody else. You are not forced to do that. You can represent yourself. But we all know that the people are not really keen of uh, uh, dwelling into politics every day, all the time, and having a strong opinion about everything. So it's not realistic. So for uh, many questions which you are not very specialized to, you are going to uh, delegate your vote to somebody else, somebody you trust. So this delegation looks like this picture on the right side. You can end up with the people having different number of votes, depending on how many people trusted their votes to them. They can hold one vote, or they can hold 12 votes or 12,000 votes, because it's not only one level delegation, it can be many levels of delegation. The whole structure, the whole pyramid of delegating votes. Yeah, it's pretty natural and easy to understand. Um, now we can move forward to even more advanced idea, which we call a liquid democracy. Um, we are adding a little bit more ingredients to it. So it's like a constant referendum. Anyone can rise an issue or put forward the motion anytime. Uh, participation is uh, direct or delegated, something like proxy democracy. And this delegation, and this is very important, is dynamic. You can grant or uh, revoke your vote anytime you like. The moment somebody you trust is not worth of that trust anymore, you revoke your vote. You say, uh-huh, this is not exactly what I had in mind, so I'm going to give my vote to somebody else. And this can happen at any time. Uh, all this process is done always separately for a separate issue. Every political question, every motion has its own life and gets voted for separately. Uh, because it's done with computers, you can have very advanced voting methods. There is a whole science of how you count votes. And some are uh, good for some things, some are good for other things. There are pluses and minuses and so on. It's a whole science and it's worth studying. It's very interesting. And I'm not going to uh, promote any of these methods. I'm just saying that by having it uh, on a computer, that it's not a problem anymore. You don't have to have a lot of people sitting on the table and counting votes and doing some calculations. It's all done by the computer. Um, and something which is not maybe uh, so obvious, but uh, the whole process allows a very high level of interaction between voters. You can imagine when you are casting your votes, there is the whole material there. There are other people casting their votes, giving comments, the exchanging arguments and so on. So there is a lot, or at least potential, for a lot more communication and exchanging of ideas on a single political issue, which is lifting the quality of the political discussion. So we are not so much obsessed anymore about loving or hating some political option A or B. We are concentrating, focusing ourselves on a single political issue, on a single question without the burden of everything else. And one thing which is even less obvious is transparency. By having such system, you are included in the political process from the beginning. It's all there, online. 
you can follow it when you want and you can follow things you think are important for you and forget about everything else. Leave other people to decide about things you don't think you have anything to add to that. Now, if we do this exercise, and we can do it more or less in our heads at the moment, because there are not much implementation of this system yet, you can come up with some very interesting consequences of uh, having a system like this, system of li uh, liquid democracy. Instead of politics, the whole body of political do doctrina uh, doctrine, you have policies, separated issues, and you can deal with them when you think it's the right moment and the right context. So these ideologies, the biggest possible packaging of ideas, are losing their weight. They are not so important anymore. You can be aware of them, you can follow some ideology of yours, and you are probably going to, because we as uh, humans are uh, made that way, that we are building some kind of ideology in our heads. But it's not so important. You don't have to choose from A or B. It can be some kind of your ideology, which is a combination, your own combination. So partisanship also loses its grounds. You know, this, uh, this uh, soccer game uh, confrontations uh, uh, are not realistic anymore because we are not going to fight so passionately just because once uh, there is a question about something and then it rises so much, uh, so much uh, emotion not so likely as now, when you have the whole package at stake. Um, there is also uh, some change in values. And this change in values, I think, is, it's very important, you know. The, the old kind of value is loyalty, you know. Uh, you give your pledge of uh, loyalty to something or somebody or some entity, like, I don't know state or uh, some leader or some political par party and then you are loyal to it and it's very important for you. And I don't think so. It's a, it's a very relevant uh, uh, value anymore. It's losing its value. It's, I think today it's more important is to be engaged, to accept responsibility for every and each of your decisions and not rely o on some pledge something you promised years ago. You have to live through every situation with responsibility and accountability. A very interesting thing which happens is the politician as a, as a job, as a vocation, is not so important anymore. Maybe this occupation is going to disappear. What we really have in liquid democracy is more of an opinion maker or opinion leader. Somebody that people tend to trust on a specific issue, maybe a couple of issues, some field of uh, connected issues, but not on everything. It's not, an, not necessary anymore. So you can now imagine your favorite politician and you are forced to follow him on all issues. Whatever he takes stance on the political field, from healthcare, education, internal policies, external policies, you are going to follow him on the whole front. And who says that you have to agree with everything? Of course you don't. But somehow it's your only, ch only choice. If you atomize all these decisions, you don't have to follow anybody anymore. You choose your opinion leader for each separate issue. And my favorite self-destructive uh, conclusion is that parties also 
lose their importance. They are not important anymore because they are packaging also these uh, political issues together in some kind of party ideology. So, <laughs> yeah, the last minute. Okay. So what are the obstacles? The biggest obstacle, I think, is it that we don't have even version 1.0 installed yet. There is a vast area of the world which today doesn't have democracy 1.0. So you cannot upgrade it from nothing. So this is a very important thing. The another one is when we have democracy 1.0, then it becomes the problem per se. If you don't have it, it's a problem. If you have it, it's also a problem. Because you have all these things that we to uh, said before. You have inertia, voter distance, apathy, um, oligarchy who is going to try to keep their positions, slowness of the political process, and so on and so on. So we have to live with it. So what should we do? How, how could we approach to upgrading the system to, to 2.0? We have to see development and advance of e-democracy. It's a good thing. Then we have to see uh, liquid democracy applications developed even further because right now as a piece of software they are not very advanced. Then we have to see implementation of this system through all kinds of institutions which are not on the sa state level. We have to come to, to start uh, on the local ground. In local governments, corporations, civic institutions, NGOs and so on. Then someday some political parties are going to implement it for their own internal democratic process. And then when voters see what's going on and that their vote is better invested in liquid democracy than in classic democracy, they're going to migrate to parties which are using liquid de de democracy internally. And after some time, inevitably, the whole system will somehow migrate from 1.0 to 2.0. How exactly? We don't know yet. But we have a feeling it's pretty inevitable. So just one slide more. Some closing, closing thoughts. Obviously, democracy needs to be improved. We are claiming that democracy can be improved. It is a major upgrade, definitely, the first after 250 years. So it will take some time. It wasn't possible before the internet. We have a very nice crisis, and I agree with Mr. Busek, it's a good thing. So it's a driver for the change. And maybe the most importantly, we are not seeing any other democratic alternative. And the, if you have any, you're very welcome to suggest me. Now we have, I think, a minute or two for questions or not. OK. <laughs> maybe later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bushi.